back to our study on the book of Hebrews. We've been going through the reading plan this summer, and I'm so grateful that you're joining us as we're diving deeper into it through these different teaching videos. Now, I know some of them are a little bit longer than others, and, and I'm trying to give as much information as I can in a short amount of time, but the book of Hebrews is packed full of theology, but also a lot of emphasis on the Old Testament. So to understand the theology, we have to go back to the Old Testament. So there's a lot of teaching, a lot of background involved, and ensuring that we're pulling out of the text what meant to, is meant to be pulled out of, rather than inserting ourselves, ourselves into the text. So whenever we're studying Scripture, we want to make sure we're excavating Scripture, we're digging down into it, not infiltrating it. And so to do that takes a little bit of extra work. And that's what we've been doing as we've been studying this, as we've been following these teaching videos and diving deeper into the text, and as we will continue to do so today. Last week, we talked about Jesus as the high priest and the background of what that means, but then taking a step further beyond that and showing the importance of establishing ourselves in that priesthood. And ensuring that we're not just nominally saying we're following him, that we're making him our high priest, but that we're continually, continually coming before him and continually allowing him to cover us. And this week we're going a little bit deeper because building off of that point of the high priest, the author of Hebrews then goes and he says, but the high priesthood, the that Jesus is a part of isn't the Levitical high priesthood. It's the order of Melchizedek. And you might be thinking, it's a big word. Who is that guy? And and luckily for us, the author of Hebrews explains who Melchizedek is to it. But just for a little bit of background, Melchizedek was a figure in the Old Testament during the lifetime of Abraham. And it was a person who blessed Abraham and whom Abraham, we are told, gave a tenth of everything to him. He was a priest of God most high. And so that's generally attributed to the fact that Melchizedek was a priest for Yahweh, was a priest for God, that, that he was established in being a mediator between the God we worship and the people. And this is confirmed by the fact that Abraham offered him a tenth of everything. So when we are you know taught to tithe ten percent that comes from Abraham giving Melchizedek a tenth of everything, offering Melchizedek a tenth of everything. But the teacher in Hebrews goes a little bit further than just the story here and identifies some key characteristics of who Melchizedek is. In fact, he identifies eight of them. So first off, what we get from the the author of Hebrews is that he is king of a people. So Melchizedek is king of a people, specifically of Salem. And he is priest, secondly, he is priest of God Most High. So he's king of a people, priest of God Most High. But for him to be this king of a people and to be the priest, that means that he not only rules the people, but he intercedes as a priest for the people between the people and God. That's a very different role, or it, it's a similar role to the ancient Near East in that many kings were worshipped as gods, but kings weren't necessarily intermediaries between the people and God. And Melchizedek, he's not worshipped as God, he's just identifying as being a mediator between the people and God, rolling the people but directing them towards God. So that's very important to note. Secondly, we see that his name means king of righteousness. So we continue down here. He says, first, his name means king of righteousness. So not only is he king of people, but he's king of righteousness, which means he is perfect. He, he is the king of holiness, the king of living correctly, the king of establishing right from wrong, and people look to him not just to roll over them, to guide them as a king, not just to bring them closer to God, but to follow him in living correctly, in being the king of righteousness. But then also he is king of peace. 
because uh, the word Salem, which we translate Salem in Hebrew, is the word Shalom, which means peace. So he is king of peace. Now, what is it that, if we recall back a few teaching videos ago, what is it that um, the, the teacher of Hebrews identifies the promise of Jesus in? It's, it's the promise of rest, the promise of peace, of, of never-ending peace, of rest, of, of Sabaoth, of this entering into God's rest, and that's peace. So Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, brings someone who is the author, the, the ruler of peace. And, and that is established in Jesus because he comes from the order of Melchizedek. Next, we see that not only is he the king of peace, but he is without, without father or mother. So this is something, you know, like because Melchizedek would have been an actual human being, he would have had a father or mother, but the text doesn't identify doesn't identify him as father or mother. So for Jesus to be of the order of Melchizedek is for him to be without father or mother. But Jesus is literally without father or mother because, as we continue forward, Jesus is also without genealogy. So he's without father or mother because he's without genealogy. And you might say, um, well. Jesus is the Davidic king. He's from the line of David. He, uh, Matthew and, and, and Luke, they identify his genealogy. So this isn't strictly true, is it? Well, what this tells us is the author of Hebrews has a high Christology. So Christology is the study of Christ. Anytime you see the word ology at the end of a word, it means the study of. And then if you look at the beginning of the word, that's what you're studying. So Christology is the study of Christ. A high Christology means you don't just view Christ as a Messiah, which is what the word Christ literally means, as an anointed one. You don't just view him as that, as a king or as a prophet or as a teacher. High Christology means you view him as God. And very early on here in the book of Hebrews, the teacher is identifying Jesus as with high Christology because he is saying he's without father or mother, he's without genealogy. Well, the disciples, they knew Jesus' mother. They knew his earthly mother of Mary. They wrote about his genealogy coming from the tribe of David. So what does this mean? He's without father or mother or without genealogy. It means they're establishing him as God. That not he doesn't have father or mother because he has no neither beginning of days nor end of life. So without beginning or end. Now, if you have no beginning... What does that mean? It means you don't have a mother. It means you don't have someone who created you. Jesus is uncreated. He is not the first creation of God. He is God. He is the unmoved mover. All things came into existence because he existed. That's what the name Yahweh means. I am that which I am. I, I just exist. I just am. Jesus is identified here by the author of Hebrews as I am, as that which has no origin. You know, he has no father or mother. He has no genealogy. He has no beginning. He simply is. He simply is. And then the last point here, point eight, is that he is the son. Uh, he is like the son of God. Now, this is something that he's identifying with Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek is one who is like the Son of God, one who is uh, holding on to the heir of God's authority. So Melchizedek is the priest between God and people. He is the king over people. He's a king of righteousness, the king of peace. That's what his name means, which means he's like the Son of God. Well, you know who's more than just like the Son of God is Jesus. He is the Son of God. And this is a very important passage because we might think that what, you know, this is just him drawing an illusion on a historical figure, but it's more than that. This is theology. This is the, the teacher of the book of Hebrews identifying key characteristics of who Jesus is, that he is king and ruler of all people. He is the intermediary between us and God. He is righteous, fully righteous, and the one who shows us righteousness. 
and reveals righteousness. He is the, um, the king of peace. He brings peace. He brings rest. He's without beginning. He's without end. He is the son of God. And for us as Gentile believers, you know, these are all good teachings. These attributes here, they're, they're important to know different details on who Jesus is. But they don't carry the same weight as it would for someone who was a Hebrew Christian. Because this is all taken directly from a very important psalm, Psalm 110. And this is a psalm that, that um, is, is quoted often in the New Testament. And it comes from David. It says, this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Now, this is important because sometimes in, in different understandings of ancient rabbis in the first century, they thought that the Lord, Yahweh, that this is the declaration of the Lord, Yahweh, of the Lord, Yahweh, to David. That's how they understood this, this psalm. That it is Yahweh to David. However, we clearly can see here that this isn't just Yahweh to David. This is Yahweh to Yahweh. So oh, that's redundant. Yahweh's talking to himself. How does this make sense? Well, it's because the Bible lays out for us the concept of the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. The word Trinity might not be in the Bible, but the concept, the teachings, the theology of God being three in one is clearly articulated, but it is a wisdom and knowledge that is given to us through the, the teaching of the Spirit in our life. And, and so as time went on, it was very easy for Christians to realize that the declaration of the Lord to my Lord means that Yahweh is declaring to himself. He, the Father is declaring to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is a messianic prophecy. It's identified to Jesus that Jesus is Lord. He is Yahweh. He works. He is in conjunction with the Godhead, and he has authority as the Godhead. Now, you might be wondering, where is this going? Well, because in this same psalm that identifies the lordship and authority of Jesus, it also identifies him as the pattern of Melchizedek. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. So, the author of Hebrews, writing to Hebrew Christians, is identifying what it means that Jesus is a part of the order of Melchizedek, but he's also identifying that Jesus is God. He's not just another Messiah. He's not just a king. He's not just an anointed one. He is God. And the order, the priesthood that he brings, it's not a renewal of the Levitical priesthood. It's an order of Melchizedek. It's different. It is something that sets apart us from the Old Testament law. And he continues on in verses 11 through 12 to identify this. He says, Now if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear? So what he's saying is Jesus could not be just a high priest of the Levitical priesthood because if, if, if perfection came from the Levitical priesthood, what would be the point of someone else? What would be the point? We, we would just eventually become perfect, right? If the Levitical priesthood was enough, then eventually we would work our way. We would build a big enough ladder. We would perfect ourselves enough that we could make it to God. But we can't. We, we simply cannot, in our own efforts, make ourselves to God. So something further was needed. And it's according to the order of Melchizedek. It's according for the order of Melchizedek. And what does this mean? And what he he explains what this means because he says, for when there's a change of priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things that we see in the Old Testament, one of the things that we see um, in the New Covenant, which we are a part of as God's uh, church, as God's people, is that we go from the law as far as the, the law of Moses, to the law on our hearts. 
That's the new covenant. So this here, the law of Moses, is the old covenant law. This law in our hearts is new covenant. And in order for the new covenant to be established, there had to be a new priesthood established. Jesus establishes that new priesthood. And it's according to the order of Melchizedek. It's according to him being king and ruler over us. It's, it's according to him bringing us to God. It's according to him being the perfecter, the, the, the person we strive to live like because he is fully righteous. It's, it's according to him bringing peace to being the king and ruler of our rest. It's according to him being eternal. To him being fully God. He has no beginning. He has no end. And this is all possible because he sits at God's right hand. Because he is Lord. This is a very, very important chapter throughout all of the Bible, let alone the book of Hebrews. Because the author of Hebrews highly establishes the divinity of Jesus. Explains the characteristic of what it means who Jesus is as a high priest and as Lord and as King. And he lays that all out for us through an explanation based in the Old Testament. And so when we look at that, when we study that, it should impact us. And, and when we read through this, we should ask, how do these eight characteristics of the, old, of the order of Melchizedek, how do they help us to pause and think about the characteristics of Jesus? How do they help us to pause and think about who he is in our life? And the second question we should ask ourselves is this. How have we tried to be our own priest? Because if you look at, at the Old Testament, the, the sacrificial system, it, and we'll get to this here soon, it was a shadow of the heavenly things to come. It was a shadow of the things that God was preparing for us, but it wasn't perfect. No one could make it on their own. No one could come to God through the Levitical priesthood, we needed Jesus. We have to have Jesus. So ask yourself, how often do you try to do it the old way rather than doing it the new covenant way with Jesus as our great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek? So think about that this week. Read through Psalm 110 as well as you're studying chapters, uh, chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews, these verses 1 through 28. And then in preparation for next week, we're going through uh, the second part of this major section of the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 1, all the way through chapter 10, verse 18. So I hope you're sticking it out. I hope you're enjoying this deeper study into the book of Hebrews, into the Old Testament. And we'll see you next time as we continue on. Thank you. We'll see you then.